technical difficulties, but happy uh, Monday uh, slash eve of Tuesday. Um, does anybody know uh, what the general topic for Monday is in, in three words or two words? The fig tree. And is this an, an easy message or a tough message to swallow? Tough, okay. Now we're on the same page. Uh, so forgive me if this message is heavy today, but uh, I'm just trying to do uh, honest by the readings that we have. Uh, so we'll read together the gospel of the first hour of Monday, of the day of Monday. Um, if this ever works, we'll get it on here, but if not, you can follow along in your, um, in your Coptic reader. It's taken from the gospel of St. Mark, chapter 11, verses 12 to 14. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat from you ever again. Extremely tough message. Um, in fact, we're going to go over a couple of fig tree facts. Um, I had a picture of a fig tree. Maybe you guys could, uh, let me see here. Can I get we're going to try to fix it one more time, please. One second. Thank you, Sean and Abram, for your assistance. Sorry, guys. Thank you for bearing with me. Oh, nothing's coming up. That's good. Not, okay, we got it. Okay, good. Perfect. So, fig tree facts. Uh, this is a fig tree uh, with its leaves. On the bottom, the darker colored figs, the ones that are like reddish purplish, are the ones that are ripe figs. And the ones that are on the top that are more greenish are the ones that are edible figs, but still not fully ripe. These are the ones that come first. So, in general, the fruit comes first. And then the leaves come afterwards, which means that uh, if you see leaves, that means that there are already some figs there. Uh, the season for figs is from August to October. Now we know that when this happened, it was around March or April. Uh, some people say March, April. And so we would not necessarily expect to see mature figs on the tree, but you would expect to see edible fruits. They are, of course, they are still immature, but they're edible fruits. And because Jesus was very hungry, he expected at least to find some of these fruits that he could just grab onto. And because he saw leaves, and in the Gospel of St. Mark specifically, he mentions that there were leaves. In fact, he says there were nothing but leaves. We expected that something would be underneath. But of course, he finds nothing, so he curses it. Now... The fig tree was cursed, and we know the fate of the fig tree because a few lines later, which is also included in the, in the gospel. Now, in the morning as they passed by, this is the next day, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. This is a miracle, obviously. Uh, a tree does not wither away by the spoken words of one man unless this man is, is God, is Jesus Christ himself. Uh, and it, we also know about the fig tree that it's a very oily tree. And so actually, if you did cut one down today, it would take months and months and months in order for it to actually wither away. 
This is the only destructive miracle in the Gospels. The only destructive miracle in the Gospels. Now, if God, who was God, created all nature, created man and woman and every animal and tree and beautiful thing that you see, why wouldn't he just create fruit immediately? Is it beyond God? I mean, certainly he could. He can do whatever he wants. He just cursed it. He could have just blessed it, and it would have appeared just like he did with the five loaves and the two fish. So it was not because it was beyond his ability. It was because he wanted to send us a bigger message, a tougher message specifically for the people at that time. This was an illustration of the hypocrisy of temple worship. Of course, we're in a temple, so I feel like wrong and bad saying this, but this is the truth. And this is exactly what Jesus was condemning. It was religion without substance. You see the leaves of the tree, but there's no fruit underneath. It's all facade. And behind this facade, there is nothing, nothing specifically that could bear fruit, literally. Further on, so they came to Jerusalem. This is the same gospel, by the way. They came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Then he taught, saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. What were these people doing? Certainly they might have been doing, must have been doing something so bad that Jesus felt the need to go in with his anger. Now we know that anger is not a sin because you can be angry and not sin, but he felt compelled enough and passionate enough to go in and overthrow tables and throw doves and throw all this kind of stuff. And what's crazier is that nobody was stopping him. He had such power and authority at that moment that he was going in and doing whatever he did because he wanted to send them a message. And he was so, so, so upset and he was appalled. He hated what they were doing. We know that the Jewish people are required to offer sacrifices. The normal sacrifice was a lamb. And so what people would do at that time, there were farmers and they used to raise lambs and trees and all those kinds of things. They used to bring the best lamb from their flock, one that was completely unspotted, one that was perfect in every way. And they would bring this so that they could offer it as a sacrifice to God. And what would happen? The priests, when they would receive this lamb, this lamb that was perfect in every way, would reject it and say, sorry, it's not good enough. You have to go and you have to buy from yourselves the lambs that are being sold in the temple. It was a very convenient business. And they were forced to pay 10 times the price of what a lamb would cost in the town. So these people were literally stealing. And when I say these people, it's more specifically the priests. Now, when Jesus is condemning the priests of that time, we know that typically if the, if the people are bad, the, people, the priest might be good. But if the priest is bad, then everybody underneath him is probably bad too. There was a pilgrimage that people used to come to Jerusalem for at the temple, and they used to attend the high feasts there. And every Jew, when they were entering into the temple, had to pay a half a shekel temple tax, which is not a lot. It's, uh, it's the equivalent of two days worth of wages. But people would come from all over the world with obviously so many different types of currency. And they would come there and they would change it. Don't forget that one of the people that Jesus was upset with was the money changers. What were these people doing? Marking up the conversion of their currency by 25%. So everybody was in on this scam. And I put up a, a picture here that you can see uh, just to kind of get an idea of where everything was and what was going on. So in red, you'll see was the Holy of Holies, the holy place where one priest would go in there once a year. Right behind the Holy of Holies in that bright green, you see an altar. This is the altar where uh, the lambs were sacrificed. Then behind that, in light blue, you have the court of Israel where the most pious Jewish men would enter. Behind that, in pink, the women's court where the women, the Jewish women would enter. And then everywhere else, to the left and to the right, of this holy place, the altar and everything, you have the court of the Gentiles. Now this 
If you wanted to get an idea of how big it was, you could fill multiple football stadiums in there. It used to be able to hold hundreds of thousands of people. So you can only imagine how disastrous and how chaotic this area was. It was full of Gentiles and Jews alike, and it was full of money changers, and it was full of people selling doves, people selling lambs, and everything was going on. All of this dirty business was happening right in the temple, right next to the Holy of Holies. Now, you couldn't have picked a worse place to conduct dirty business than this place right here. And when Jesus went in to overthrow these tables and to do what he did, it was happening in the court of the Gentiles. Further, about temple corruption, if you were poor, instead of the lamb, you could give a dove. We know that in Luke chapter 2, Mary and Joseph were poor, and so they presented, with when they presented Christ to the temple, right before they presented him to Simeon, they presented two turtle doves. Now, normally, these doves would cost five cents. Five cents. It was cheap enough where any poor person could purchase it. But in the temple, it was four dollars. So if you pay attention now and you read the gospel, you will see he overthrew also the tables of the doves, because that was one of the things that he was so upset with. Now, interestingly enough, these were called the bazaars of Annas. Does anybody remember who Annas was? You will see his name later on in the week. Uh, he was the high priest at that time of the Jewish nation, and his family owned these bazaars. How convenient. And the priests were in on this business, and they would split the profits with these vendors who were cheating the people. Now, you remember in the story of the Good Samaritan, the man who was robbed was on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho. And this road was very famous for having uh, very, very windy, having lots of caves and kind of hidden places. It was poorly lit. And many, many robbers used to hide in this area. And it was known as the most dangerous place that you could ever walk. And that's why Jesus used it in the story of the Good Samaritan. But they used to say at that time, just to illustrate how corrupt the temple was, that there are worse thieves in the temple courts than ever there are in the caves of the Jericho Road. Sorry, that was a lot. How does Jesus, what did Jesus say about hypocrisy? Well, why are we talking about hypocrisy? Um, when you love somebody, whether it's your spouse or your God, it's very important to know two things. Number one, what they love, so that you can please them with what they love. And number two, what they hate, so you can avoid doing it. For example, I know that uh, when I go to In-N-Out and I order for my wife, I know not to get pickles. I get a double-double for myself, animal style regular. And for her, it's animal style without pickles. If I get her one with pickles, she's not going to eat it, and she's not going to be happy. But by knowing what she hates, I can actually please her more than not knowing. What did Jesus say about hypocrisy? Well, if we go to the foundation of Christianity and all what you need to know about Christianity is mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount, what does he say in Matthew 6, verses 1 and 2? Take heed or beware that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. He hates it. You can tell that he hates it. And we want to have nothing to do with it. The word hypocrite comes from the Greek word hypocrites, which means, literally means, an actor who gets on a stage and masks their real identity. And this mask that you see up here is actually a mask taken from the first century and one that would have been used in Jesus' time. Literally, they used to go up and have these plays, their version of Broadway, and they used to put on those masks so that they could take on different roles. And that is what a hypocrite is, someone who is externally different than what they are internally. Now, there's a, a famous story of an Eastern ascetic a holy man, he was non-Christian, he was a holy man, and he was in the middle of the streets. And he used to sit in the busiest street corner of the town, and everybody would kind of walk by and look, 
look how holy and how ascetic this man is. He sits here all day. He doesn't move. He doesn't eat. He doesn't drink. He doesn't shower. He doesn't do anything. He just kind of sits here all day. He wasn't doing it out of poverty, but he was doing it out of asceticism. So finally, one visitor, one tourist came and said, can I take your picture? And he said, sure, but let me arrange my ashes. Let me arrange my ashes. What did he want to do? He wanted to arrange his ashes in such a way that he could appear more ascetic than what he actually was while he was in the middle of the town showing everybody how holy he actually was. This is hypocrisy. Obviously, we don't do it today, but there are a couple of verses that I want to bring to your attention from the Old Testament, which really kind of struck a chord with me and actually very difficult to read. In the book of Amos, chapter 5, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Take away from me the noise of your songs, but ju let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. This one hit me differently this year because in no other week out of the entire year do we have more feast days. And God here is saying, I hate your feast days. In no other week of the year do we assemble more in church. And God is saying, I do not savor your sacred assemblies. And in no other week in church do we sing more songs and more hymns than we do this week. And he's saying, take them away from me. He does not want our feast. He does not want our assemblies. He does not want our singing. He wants our hearts. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, on a similar note, it says, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far away from me. So it wasn't just an exception of one time that the people at the time of Amos we're doing these things also in Isaiah and also in the New Testament and also in Genesis and also in Acts and also everywhere in the Bible, you will find hypocrites. And God is saying, I don't care about what you say to me with your mouth and how, no matter how much honor you say to me with your lips, it does not matter and it does not mean anything unless your heart is also with him. Well, then you might ask, then what about my light? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to perform good works and good acts if every time I perform a good work or a good act, I'm perceived to be a hypocrite? Also in the Sermon on the Mount, it says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. He does not say that they may see your good works and glorify you. The motive of the example that Christ gave in chapter 5 and in chapter 6 are completely different. One person was doing it for himself and sounding a trumpet so that everybody could listen, and this person was performing good works so that people could see him but glorify God. So the problem is with the motive. That's the difference. And St. Augustine actually sums it up very nicely. He says, the problem with the hypocrite is his motivation. He does not want to be holy. He only wants to seem to be holy. He is more concerned with his reputation for righteousness than about actually becoming righteous. The approval of men matters more to him than the approval of God. When I read this, I was like, wow, what a beautiful way to sum it up. The definition of a hypocrite, according to St. Augustine, is when someone values the approval of men more than the approval of God. Do we do this today? Do we care about society's approval? Are we living one life on social media and another life behind closed doors? Anybody who owns a business knows the value of Yelp. When you open a business, what do you do? You text your friends, you text your family, and you say what? Leave me a five-star review, please, thank you because you know the value of the opinions of other people on your business. And what happens when you receive a negative review? When you receive a negative, you say, I can't believe they left this negative review. They didn't even come to, they... And you get so upset from this negative review. I imagine that all of us are like walking Yelp pages, even if you don't have a business. As long as you're here, you have a Yelp page. You are a little Yelp page. 
And that you care so much, and when I say you, I actually mean me, forgive me, it's a collective you that includes me, or maybe not you and just me, but this is how I feel. I'm a walking Yelp page, and when someone leaves me a good review, words of affirmation, I am so happy, and it means so much to me. How does it feel when you receive a compliment? And when someone leaves me a bad review, or says something bad to my face, or even worse, behind my back, I'm broken. I'm broken. Even though, even though we know that people are liars, people are cruel, and that it doesn't necessarily mean that what they said is true. But otherwise, either way, it still hurt me. In fact, uh, King David in the Psalm says, the words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. People can appear nice to you, but behind closed doors, what are they saying? His words were softer than oil, then they were drawn with swords. People are mean, and it hurts when someone says mean to us, something mean to us or about us. This, this quote I loved. Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. How many times do you think about all of the bad things and all of the wrong things that other people are doing when actually we're doing the same thing and we're guilty of the same thing. It is so easy for me to point out the speck in other people's eyes but ignore the plank in my own. But forget about people. Forget about people, what they say, what they do, and what we say and do to them. How often do we seek God's approval? How often do I care about what is God going to think of me? Forget about people. Most of the time, I spend my, my time thinking of how will people treat me or how will people react if I do this or I do that, if I say this or I say that, or I think this, or how often do I ask myself, well, would God approve of me if I did this? Or what if I went and did this and that? Would God approve of me? Or do I think more of, the approval of men rather than the approval of God. If God left me a review on my Yelp page, how many stars would he give me for my spiritual life? And if everybody in the world gave me five stars, but God gave me a one-star review, then what matters more? What's the solution? In Matthew chapter 23, you read this chapter and you're like, you see kind of how bad the scribes and the Pharisees and the woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you, all the bad things that they were doing at that time. But Christ also provides the solution in that chapter. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish that the outside of them may be clean also. We need to focus on cleaning the inside so that the outside could be clean. How many of you are familiar with Marie Kondo? A lot of people. What does she have to do with Holy Week and the fig tree? Not much. She, she, if, if you don't know who she is, she's a world-renowned organizer and tidier, and she wrote books and had Netflix specials and did all this stuff, and that's literally all she does is she teaches you how to declutter, but she became a multimillionaire because of it, and she is a genius. And her famous question and what she encourages all, us all to do is, like, when you're cleaning out your example, uh, when you're cleaning out your closet, for example, you pick up a T-shirt or you pick up a pair of pants and you hold it. And you ask yourself, does it spark joy? And if it does, you keep it. And if it doesn't, you get rid of it. Can we apply this to our spiritual lives? What if we all examined ourselves? But instead of asking if all of the actions and all of the commitments and all of the words and all of the thoughts that we have, if they spark joy for us, do they spark joy for God? Is God pleased? If God were to hold all of my actions and my life in his hands, would I spark joy for him? There's a prayer in Psalm 139 that I hope that we can have the confidence and the boldness to pray this week. 
Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. By praying this prayer with King David, we're saying, God, come and look inside my heart. I have done my cleaning. I've done my tidying. I've done my organizing. Come, come and search in my heart. And if there's anything that you don't like, take it out. I don't want it. Because if it doesn't please you, it shouldn't please me. And I want you to lead me to heaven, not me to lead myself to destruction by seeking the approval of other men. So finally, there's a question that I want us all to ask ourselves in every hour, with every thok that you go, where thine is the power, which is when we pray, do we say and do we mean thine is the glory or mine is the glory? I pray that God can give us all the wisdom and the strength to go through this week and the, through the power of the resurrection to be strengthened for his glory and glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.